We're going to get a guided tour of the pictures now, ladies and gentlemen. Roll up, you lucky people. <laughs> Standing up is the way it's got to be because there aren't any chairs we're talking about and that's good because we'll, we'll stroll along. Normally I talk for about an hour but uh, we've got less than an hour before Gideon Libby starts. So I'm actually going to do the first half of the exhibition and hopefully get that done in less than half an hour and then I'm just going to say three or four words about the rest and leave you to look at it yourself. And uh, we'll start the film up again. Um, after I finish speaking, if there is any time. And that's a, that's a very valuable 10 minute film, I think, once you've got some of this background. So, let's start. This stuff you can read for yourself. You know what Gaza looks like, 24 miles long or so, eight, four miles wide. Um, I took a van with a convoy, filled it full of paintings. These girls painted it in graffiti, but I couldn't bring it out, so I just came out with one big envelope of pictures, and this is them, and a few more. The thing you need to read about this is, because this is essentially what the theme of the, of the pictures is about, Kali Alabu Fool is the Red Crescent chief spokesman. I interviewed him and he said, this war did not just have 1,500 killed or 5,000 wounded, it has traumatized the entire population, all 1.5 million. Uh, and that's essentially what this is about. Uh, this is for adults, this is for children. This is more interesting, actually. Much more interesting, I think. I wrote the both. It's really well written. Well, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I'm a former teacher. All right, praise later, please. I, I, I'll do, make a do with it later. Uh, here's, a, here's a kind of typical picture, if you like. I mean, this is very cleverly done, making the letters Gaza out of houses, and here's a mosque uh, being blown up, and here's a blow-up so you can see it. People trying to leave home, but the picture itself tells you what the problem is. There it is, Gaza, surrounded by barbed wire. Where are they going? They're just going to go to another place in flames. The Israeli army attacked through here, Beit uh, They attacked Rafa, and they had forays in. They, of course, uh, uh, there was artillery from the sea, and, uh, and everywhere was bombed. People took me to see uh, bomb-hit buildings all over Gaza. And then later, as we'll come to, uh, this old settlement provides a, an open route. So towards the end of the attack, they, uh, in about the second week, they brought uh, a flanker movement round, so they had Gaza pincered, and that's the Battle of Tal al Hawa, which we'll come on to. This picture is a stunning picture, I think. It doesn't fit in the exhibition in the themes that I've got, so that's why it stands there at the front and it's a poster, and I use it now to remind you that for £10 you can own one. Okay? So that's a 14 year old, this child, and what she said when I interviewed her about, uh, well, I just asked her to talk about the picture, and she said, I paint this painting because my, my teachers told me I should show my talent to the world. Uh, and I think that this is, again, the essence of the healing of the trauma, that the world appreciates what these children are as human beings, and they're expressing that through art. So telling her to show her talent to the world, he's not showing off, it's just saying, you've got a talent and share it and you're a valuable person, your talent is of some value, not, you're not just a, uh, an animal in a zoo surrounded by barbed wire. So the exhibition starts proper with uh, the idyll before the storm, these are pictures which uh, suggest uh, that from the children the way that they think Gaza could be if they were left alone in peace, or perhaps how it was before in their imagination. So all these little kids and, a, and an older girl. And uh, the essence of these is that they're all outside. Gaza, as you know, is very densely uh, occup uh, occupied. Um, Jabalia camp, probably one of the most densely occupied places in the world, uh, where there are 80,000 people just in a square kilometre, and they build the houses straight up off the tent plots because it was a refugee camp. So width of the tent and the building goes up and they're jammed together. Um, uh, but there are pockets of land, and in fact some quite big, relatively big spaces of land, despite the fact there's a million and a half people in that space. But of course it is at a premium, and so it's very valued. This is, this is the idea, this is the dreamscape of kids, just simply to be able to go out and play on a piece of land. It's always going to have trees on it, because the trees are productive, and they, and they give shade. So here we have pictures of football in front of the house. There's trees shown. Uh, this poplar tree is a good, uh, is a good windbreak tree. Uh, 
oranges, uh, more oranges, date palm, smiling sun, uh, it's a common image of growing the trees. Um, these uh, trees take a minimum of five years from planting to get to anything bearing any kind of fruit. So they take a great deal of investment. Um, if you were kids, I'd say to you, who knows where the idea of Noah's, uh, of the dove with, uh, with the uh, olive branch in its mouth comes from, and people would say Noah's Ark. But, but yes, we know why the dove, because he released the dove, but why the olive branch? What, why, why was the olive branch picked? And the reason is nomads don't own land, so they don't grow trees. Planting a tree, given that it takes at least five years to bring it to fruit, means you've made a commitment to that piece of land for five years. So there's a real sense in which you own the land. Olive trees, beautifully drawn here, if you look, come and look at them closer later, they're all smiling. Um, and this olive tree is saying to its mate, look at my gardener. I've got my own gardener. Uh, and uh, they take even longer. So maybe ten years before you're getting any production. So you have to make a 10-year commitment to that piece of land. So you've got a lot invested in those trees. When you give somebody a twig of olive, you're saying to them effectively, I know where you live, and I accept that you live there, and that that's your land, and it's not my land, and I'm giving you an olive branch so that you can plant that olive. And you know, I'll, as far as I'm concerned, I'll allow you to look after it for, for the 10 years that you need, and longer. So it's a real acceptance of the other person's estate uh, hence, it's a, a symbol of peace, a peace offering. Um, and of course, bulldozing them means quite the contrary. Just before we move on to that, uh, this picture, older, more sophisticated picture, has some standard symbols. Old woman uh, Palestine or old woman Gaza, traditional Arab clothes. Here's the bean uh, shoot. This means, as it does in Jack and the Beanstalk, um, prosperity. Uh, beans are rich in protein, you have lots of beans, climb the beanstalk, somehow mythically you get rich. Uh, traditional Arab housing, which nobody builds anymore, mud brick with domed roofs. So they're starting to in Gaza because they haven't got steel, but of course you can't build them very high. But it's a folk, it's their folk tradition of, of traditional housing. Here's the more symbolic bit, the, the beating heart of the Palestinian people, you might call that, a Palestinian flag. Uh, being towed at the other end by the Dove of Peace with the uh, Aqsa Mosque safely in its breast, towing this sun that we see smiling elsewhere, this kind of sense of well-being. So that's an altogether kind of uplifting image. Um, this uh, cactus is a very, very important image. It's, it's, an, it's, it's a very ancient image uh, for Arabs, and it means patience. But more recently, the meaning's changed a little. And it's come to mean this word samud. I don't know whether many of you will know that. Uh, and, it, and that means more to do with steadfastness. And it's about being rooted to the spot, staying, not, not being pushed off, not being expelled. But also it has the same concept intellectually, not uh, denying your own culture, uh, retaining your identity, not being allowed to be pushed off. Uh, and the reason it's particularly become so is because uh, in Israel, where Arab villages after 48 were ethnically cleansed, uh, they uh, completely dug up, in some cases, all the footings of all the houses so they could never be relocated again. But this stuff is extremely persistent, and it won't go away even if you dig it up. And so, in, in the case specifically of Norway Park, which the Norwegians gave the Israelis some money to make a kind of country park, uh, some Israelis uh, went along and traced the line of regrowing cactus. It was the only thing left. Straight lines, because they use it for boundary fencing, uh, the Palestinians. So, the straight lines of cactus coming through traced the fields, and they could locate the village centers and plot these ethnically cleansed, you know, non-existent villages. So a very important symbol of cactus. So that's what Palestine could be like. Uh, but of course, uh, in uh, uh, not January 2009, of course, but December 2008, uh, the invasion started. So this now, in the light of what you've heard there, is self-explanatory. Why the tree is crying, why the sun is crying, 
these F-16s are even shooting down the birds in the sky. I mean, it's metaphysical. Uh, this is not a, a, a bulldozer. It's meant to be a bulldozer, but it's symbolic. This person's never seen a bulldozer. Um, all they know is what happened. This is an allegorical picture uh, and the tank. But, the, but, but in real life, the bulldozers do go in front and they clear a swathe completely so the tanks can roll through. This picture is called in my uh, JPEG file, 75% of our agricultural land was destroyed. And that's Baytonu municipality, which is the first point of contact as they roll across the border. In this picture, you can see a more accurate drawing of a bulldozer, a D9, a Caterpillar D9. Uh, it's twice the size of these tanks, and that's about right. They're huge, uh, much bigger than the tanks, and there it is tearing down the, um, the, thing, uh, the, uh, the trees. And I've uh, got some F-16s and so on. Uh, and the tack also obviously moves into the town. This uh, little drawing, I'm rushing on a bit, you might tell, but uh, I want to get as much in as possible. This little drawing is done by a girl called Samahair. Uh, I hope I've got that right. Um, and it's a picture of a tree that's packed its bag and it's running away. And the little boy is saying to his mother, as if they trees do that all the time, why is it running away? And uh, the mother says, well, because it doesn't want to be turned into firewood, and the tree's dreaming of a, um, of a tank, actually a tank rather than a bulldozer. This, this girl, uh, uh, I was told her story, she was there, but she doesn't speak, she doesn't want to speak anymore. She does say some things, and she did to me, but very little. Um, uh, so the story was really told for her, but as I understand it, uh, she, her grandfather owned a plot of land. I remember seven dunams, about an acre and three quarters, an olive grove. The tanks, uh, the bulldozers came, flattened it. Her brother, they didn't live together, her brother was sent for to go and see what could be done about it. He turned up and he got shot because he's a young, able, bloody man, so of course he got shot by the Israelis. Um, she now won't leave the house. Uh, she goes to school and she comes straight back home. Uh, she only draws pictures, because this is actually an old picture, she drew this straight away. She now only draws pictures of American houses, and she says, I want to live there. And that's really all she says. Trauma. More bulldozers. Uh, again, quite accurately drawn, quite accurate tanks. Uh, and uh, even that's not bad. Uh, if, uh, Apache helicopter. Um, there's a lot in this picture. This says Gaza under, um, under destruction, something like that. Um, here's a body with blood and bits chopped off. Here's some uh, rockets for the resistance to use. Uh, here is an ambulance being hit. Uh, and here is a mosque tower being toppled. Here's a phosphorus bomb. Uh, the thing about children's art is that if it's uncontaminated, which I'm pretty sure that all of this selection is, then it tends not to lie. Uh, kids don't know that they're not supposed to paint pictures of rockets. They don't know that. Uh, they don't know that they're supposed to, not to paint pictures of resistance fighters, as you'll see in other pictures. They don't know that that's not good things to do. And in the same way, they don't know that they're not supposed to paint pictures of ambulances being shot. And so I think that one of the things you can get from these pictures is some kind of truth, as it's been witnessed. This is a beautiful uh, drawing. Uh, these aren't quite so beautiful, but they're even younger kids who know even less about what they are supposed and not supposed to draw. Um, this is essentially a list of Israeli war equipment. An Apache. I need my glasses, excuse me. Another Apache um, F-16. Uh, uh, another Apache, and this is a drone here, an unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with them. Uh, there's another one here, and another one here, um, and another one here, in fact. And that's what they look like, little crosses in the sky. They're kind of like big model aircraft, or, uh, and uh, they're flown um, remotely from perhaps Tel Aviv, the basement of some, uh, well, it doesn't have to be the basement, um, and they're completely controlled. You can't, the operator can't even see the plane that they're flying. They're, they're controlled by satellite, and they're flown entirely through a computer screen. So, to me, I can't see any difference between playing a game like uh, Grand Theft Auto